Hi, I am Cindy and I am a literary gladiator contributor and I am also the municipal liaison for NaNoWriMo for the South New Jersey Shore region. Um, I am going to give you another writing tip or writing how to if you prefer and this time the topic is uh, story structure and um, then I have another little segment that I'm going to add into it. I'm also going to talk about uh, some of the common mistakes that we make as inexperienced writers. So let's just dive in. Um, before we begin, I'd like you to consider in the novel A Christmas Carol where you would find the inciting incident, the key moment, and the first plot point. And I will be sharing my thoughts on their placement. If you're ready, let's dive in. Uh, sorry, my throat's a little scratchy. At one is your beginning, and it will likely take about 25% of your story. It's the story set up. Here is where you write about the world that your main character lives in at the story's beginning. It is their normal world. The setup consists of your hook, the key event, the inciting incident, and will propel your, your characters into their journey, leading the characters out of the so-called normal life and into the adventure, where values, identity, and all things sacred are challenged by adversarial forces, persons, and situations in the second act. In Act 2, which is your story middle and is the largest piece of your story, your character and his or her world is challenged, the stakes are raised, and the world details are revealed as the adventure toward the uh, story's end approaches. Uh -oh. In the final act where resolution takes place, this second act makes up about 50% of your story, and the final act will make up the last 25%. You pay very close attention, please, to your story word count because agents and publishers are using the word count in their manuscript evaluation. Okay, let's talk about the hook. The hook is placed in the first chapter. Better to get it into the first paragraph or the first page. Uh, this is the thing that will compel a reader to engage with your story. It must be organic to the story. It must be an essential part. It's not... Uh, something that's a minor detail. It's got to be a driving force. It should set up the action inherent in your story, if possible. The hook should involve the novel points and the conflict, the major plot points and the conflict for maximum effect. Now, okay, I want to talk about the key event, the inciting incident, and the first plot point. They're not the same. They do intersect. There are subtle differences which will be important to the flow of your story. The inciting incident occurs about the 10 to 12% of the story and is where the protagonist first hears the call to adventure. The character might not choose to respond to the call yet. It might take a bigger push to get him or her involved, but the character cannot forget the incident. It has his or her or their attention, as the case may be. The key moment, which is slightly different, is the moment where the character has experienced that call to adventure. Now it must be responded to. Tension will continue to build and build until the moment when the character is forced to step into the journey. 
plot point one will take your protagonist to and through the point of no return moment where act one concludes and act two begins. The key event can easily be confused with the first plot point. They're not the same. However, they are in fact like two sides of a coin or two sides of the same gateway. Many times they could be close to one another in proximity in the story. So much so they might seem like they are one event, but they are not. At other times, the distinction is far more clear. Either way, they're kind of twins. You can't have one without the other. Conjoined. Here is the example from A Christmas Carol. which is my favorite Christmas story. The inciting incident takes place when Jacob Marley appears to Scrooge. The key event is the arrival of the ghost of Christmas past. And when Scrooge agrees to go with Christmas past, this is the first plot point, which concludes act one and brings Scrooge and us into act two. In the first half of the second act, your, char your character, your protagonist, is probably reacting very demonstratively to the first plot point and to the new world that he has found himself in. There's a lot to be figured out. The stakes will be raised at every turn. This will have a dynamic effect on the next quarter of the book with the character exploring ways to resolve the problems he or she faces while learning new skills and moving the plot forward, revealing the theme and the adversarial forces driving the plot. At the same time, the writer can have some fun with character and world building while taking time to foreshadow the vital elements. Okay. Um, in the... second half of that uh, the character begins to put things that he or she's learning into practice so you have two halves of the second act it's rather a large area and it's easy to get lost in there raise your hand if you've ever gotten lost in the second act of what you've written in its own roadmap. It really does. Um, so you have a lot to think about with that. And I will probably devote a video to the second act exclusively because there's so much more to go into and then you can get out of one short video so i'll keep that in mind okay so here we go back to the story in the story of christmas carol the three ghosts are teaching him the skills that scrooge must have if he is to escape marley's fate at first scrooge simply wants to get the visits over with and you can see this when he says can't we just get them all done at what one time and be done with it. Well, it doesn't work that way. He'd learn nothing. But by the time it rolls around to the second plot point where he's met the ghost of Christmas past, Scrooge is beginning to see that he's held on to a lie for many years and it has been destructive. He's beginning to see the truth that one cannot measure all things by cost. There might be intrinsic value in things, too. And these things have no cost. Um, as his nephew, Fred, tried to tell him early on in the book. Still, Scrooge has much more to learn. During the second half of Act 2, Scrooge is slowly demonstrating the things that he has learned. And is slowly learning to change his heart as he begins to see the world through others' eyes with the Spirit's help. So first he's reacting to the first plot point, and now he's responding to the changes that he has to make. The third plot point takes place 
when Scrooge encounters the final ghost who shows him the future he faces if his remain if his life remains unchanged. And this brings the story to Act Three. Scrooge begins to truly grasp the worthlessness of a life devoted to money. The climax then occurs when Scrooge vows to keep the lessons learned and to honor Christmas all year long. And finally, in the resolution, we see how changed the man he has become. Okay, this is such a wonderful story, and it is a story of redemption, the likes of which I have rarely seen, which is probably why I love it so very much. Now, I want to get into the structure of our story. I also want to talk about some of the common mistakes we make. I'm not going to get into all of them. I actually have a list of 21 things and I cut down that list. So let's see how many I can get through. Uh, some of them I feel like they just don't need an explanation. Um, but let me see if I can get through the worst things that we tend to do. Um, okay. The things we do is we shift tenses. Uh, there is a place for it. it. There's a literary device known as the historical present, in which case you may uh, shift tenses to indicate uh, a change in time frame. But it's rare for a beginner writer to do this well. So that's something to be on guard. If you find yourself writing in one tense and then another frequently, take a look at your writing and make sure that you are, for the most part, in the present tense or the past tense and not flipping back and forth. That is every bit as bad as head hunting, head, head hopping, sorry, head hopping, which is another thing that we do frequently and should not be done. Uh, you can change whose point of view you're in, but it needs to be done in a way that is natural to the story. Otherwise, your reader will be confused as to who we're, who we're with. You need to know whose point of view you're following. And when it changes, there needs to be a clear um, defining something, uh, a change in location, a change in um, time of day, something that indicates it. And that too is a thing that should be done carefully. The other thing, another thing that we do is info dumping. That means you're dumping a large amount of information at a time, uh, basically throwing a narrative full of backstory. Uh, a better approach would be to season the story with a subtle hint of these details. By all means, sprinkle some here and there as it is relative to your chapter. But remember that most info dumping is a clumsy attempt to tell things about the characters that would be best revealed when important within the story. Another thing that we tend to do is we use excess dialogue tags or extensive telling tags. It's ad adverb abuse. It simply isn't necessary to include tags all the time. Oh, my throat is sore. Okay, if the speaker is angry, for instance, perhaps he might be written as having nostrils of flare rather than he spoke angrily. Because you want to show your character is angry. You don't want to just tell your reader. Um, another thing we do is we use repetitive 
sentence structures. We begin every sentence with a pronoun, an article, and God forbid, conjunction. It's not necessary and it causes your story to lack luster and your writer will put the book down. Not my will. It's not necessary to start off every sentence with he did this and she did that. And he thought, she thought. He said, she said. No, just don't. Okay, it's just, it creates wordiness that is not necessary. You should be authentic in your speech pattern. So read your work out loud. Uh, melodrama, that's another downfall. And all I'm going to say is, unless you're writing for a soap opera, save the melodramatic for those who are. Not said. Redundant writing. Extra words. No one says it better than Stephen King. In his writing memoir on writing, King said, kill your darlings, kill your darlings, even when it breaks your eccentric little scribbler's heart, kill your darlings. Could be, a, could be a song, right? Kill your darlings, kill your darlings, even though it breaks your heart. Kill your darlings if you're able, then your truth you will impart. We need to come up with a different verse. It needs more. <clears throat> I just think that's fun. I do. Uh, then, of course, there's the usual suspects, the grammar and spelling errors. So read every page you write carefully, out loud, and slowly. There is no replacement for your own eyes and ears. Spell check, helpful. Grammar check, that's cool. But nothing replaces your own eyes and ears. Trust me, I have looked at things years after I wrote them and found things that my tools did not find. And I trusted the tool, so I ended up with an imperfect piece of writing. Okay, then there are other things that we do, and there's quite a few, and I'm not going to get into all of them in this video. I may get into them later. But I'm just going to give you a really quick rundown of some of these others because, as I said, there's a total of 21 and we've gotten to seven. So, kind of rapid fire, okay? Um, filler scenes in excess description. That would be number eight. Uh, number nine would be poor pacing. Got to watch the pace and keep it even. Don't have a slow beginning and then a fast middle and a slow ending. Uh, number 10, exposition that's disguised as dialogue. That's cheating. Okay. Uh, number 11, all of A plot and the missing B plot. In other words, you need the main overarching storyline and you need at least one subplot um if you were writing for any movie you wouldn't have just the a plot otherwise you'd have the characters would have to be in every scene there'd be nothing in between and that would be kind of harsh so you want to write like it's a novel, and you want to, in your mind, also see the scenes in as if they're a movie. It's a good way that I remind myself to make sure I've got an A plot and B plot. Number 12, flat characters. You want your characters well-rounded. You want them to be... Uh, to appear to be living creatures. You want them to be alive, vibrant. Okay. 13. Watch your punctuation and your capitalization. 14. Now, we already talked about that one. That's head, head hopping. We talked about that before. Okay. Uh, 15. Actually, I mentioned this one earlier. You don't want you want to show rather than tell. 
if at all possible. You want to do both telling and showing, but honestly, you want to do it as it is natural for the story. 16. Watch your story logic. Your logic in your story has to be well thought out. 17. Beware the purple prose. We like a little bit of flowery speech, but again, it's got to be natural. It's more important to have natural speech. 18. Stiff formal writing. It's imperative that your writing be natural. If you're writing for academia, then of course you still want that formal writing to be there. But if you're writing for a novel, a short story, poetry, okay, it's not formal and it's not stiff and it's got to be just readable. Otherwise, it's not going to get read. Um, 19. The wrong word count for you for the genre i i said earlier i said to beware of your word count because publishers are looking at it and that's part of how they determine which projects they're going to get behind 20 too many characters maybe it could be that you don't have enough characters as well but you don't want to have a lot of characters unless you're like writing um a saga if you're running root, you know, some kind of an ancestral story about a family and generations, then you want all, all kinds of characters. But really, you probably don't need that many. Uh, most stories, you're going to have four. Let me see. Um, your main characters in The Stand. How many are there? Um well, you've got the four that go down to Vegas. You've got Mother Abigail and a few more. I mean, there are a lot of people that come in and they're extras. They show up, but just briefly. So, and that was a big book. Okay. So you want to pay attention to your characters, how many you have, and whether or not that's a character you need. If you can blend two characters together and come up with a composite of that works, then you probably should do that. Uh, the other thing, the last thing, uh, number 21, perfect and passive characters. In other words, um, well, in a word, lame. You don't want them perfect because that's not human. That's not real, and it's not engaging, it's not interesting, it will bore the heck out of your reader, and it will probably bore you, you as a writer. So, that would be the major things that we do wrong as inexperienced writers. And, uh, yeah, that's about it, the end of that. Uh, so... With that, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to head out. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. And until next time, happy writing, happy reading. Have a good one.